Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. For the sake of those joining us for the first time, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is George Manguinness, and I am the Academic Director of the Benaki Museum. I am delighted to welcome you to the second installment of the second series of Hellenic Together Lectures, co-organized by the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center and the Benaki Museum. Hellenic Together Lectures began during last spring's lockdown as a way to bring together two communities separated by thousands of miles, but united by many more things than the pandemic, mostly united by their love for Hellenic culture. We offered six lectures last spring and four more are programmed for this autumn. The first season's lectures are available at the Benaki Museum website. Last week's lecture, given by Xenia Politu on Greek dress, was attended by Her Excellency Alexandra Papadopoulou, ambassador of the Hellenic Republic to the United States, who also extended a greeting. Now, our usual bit of housekeeping. In order for our speaker to be heard uninterrupted, during her lecture, all microphones will be placed on mute. Our speaker has kindly agreed to take questions after the lecture. However, even then, please keep your microphones muted. Finally, if you wish to ask a question, please use the chat function, which appears on a bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This time, instead of just asking you your whereabouts in the world, we would like you to use the chat function to take a small survey. So please let us know using chat, which of the two popular dishes you prefer, pasticcio or imam baildi. It will become clear by the end of the lecture what the challenge refers to. And now I would like to invite Professor Sharon Gerstel, Director of the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture to introduce tonight's speaker. It is a tremendous pleasure to introduce today a scholar whom I have long admired, Dr. Anna Balian. Dr. Balian, Curator Emerita at the Benakis Museum, completed her undergraduate work in history and archaeology at the University of Athens, her MA in Islamic art and archaeology at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London, and her doctorate at the University of Birmingham in the prestigious Center for Byzantine Ottoman and Greek Studies. For many years, she was curator of the collection of post-Byzantine metalwork and textiles at the Benaki Museum, until she moved to the newly formed Museum of Islamic Art, where she served as chief curator. Now, I'm not sure that everyone knows that the curators of the Benaki Museum have a reputation for their excellent scholarship, which is supported by a library in the museum and an outstanding journal of international standing. I came very early on to know Anna Balian through the strength of her publications particularly a number of important exhibition catalogs, Armenian relics of Cilicia and relics of the past, treasures of the Greek Orthodox Church and the population exchanges. Together with Mina Moraitu, an outstanding speaker from our earlier series, and Maria Sardi, a consultant at the museum, Balian also co-authored a, a guide to the Museum of Islamic Art, a guide that provides important information about the Benaki Museum's excellent holdings in this area. Her publications, all of them meticulously researched, reveal her eclectic interests and her global view in silver objects produced in Ottoman Trikala in Thessaly, to the silk industry of Chios, to liturgical vessels from the Pontus, to a bird-shaped ewer on Mount Sinai, the players in her work include Byzantines, Ottomans, Genoese, Seljuks, Armenians, merchants, silver miners, 
princes, priests, and patriarchs. I'm very pleased that today, Anna Balian will be presenting a subject that is of interest to many scholars who work in Greece, and one that fascinates anyone who gazes with admiration at the colorful bowls decorating the facades of so many Greek churches. What are these bowls? Why are they immured in church walls? And what do they represent? I leave it to Dr. Balian to answer these questions. Dr. Balian. Well, thank you so much for these nice words, uh, Sharon. Um, I remember very well the first time we met in the basement of the Benaki, who came in our, in our office, the office that we shared with Anastasia. And I remember I, I was amazed at the, at the way you could read Greek, even the ancient Greek, the, the, the archaic Greek, the Katarebus, all these uh, uh, articles by the uh, Byzantine knowledge of the early 20th century that you had read, I couldn't read them, but you, you already had read them. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for these words. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. It's such an amazing thing that uh, so many people from so many different parts of the world uh, join together to, to listen to lectures. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this project and talk for the UCLA and the Stavros Nyakos Center. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, in this lecture, I will uh, talk about ceramic vessels. Maybe I should turn my share screen on. Eh? So I'm doing this. Um, I'm not sure I succeeded. Launch me, no. Okay. Um, so, is it okay? Um, Anna, we need you to look at your PowerPoint screen to select that. So if you can unshare your screen and then reshare it and select your PowerPoint, that would... Um, hold on, hold on. Um, I, I'm sharing now. It's, it's, it's on my, it's on my uh, uh, desk. So you, you are not looking at my PowerPoint? Not yet. We're looking at your other screen. So unshare what you've showed us and okay. share. I'm unsharing, stop share, and I'm doing this again. I, uh, um, Etsy, bravo. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> okay, so now I need to. Now is it okay now? It's perfect. Thank you. We can hear you very well. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm relieved. Okay, this is my title <laughs> Machini or Renewed Vessels. So, this lecture today is about ceramic vessels, glazed polychrome bowls or dishes, inured in the exterior walls of post Byzantine churches. Is it, uh, is it okay with the, 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 the sound? Okay. So this decoration is a distinctive kind of architectural decoration that Italians call, but call bacini, which means bowl, a term that has prevailed because Italian scholars were the first to study the phenomenon of ceramic vessels, ornamenting the exteriors of religious building of, uh, in Italy from the 11th century to the 15th century. The spread of this practice appears to have followed the sea routes and commercial networks opened up by Italian maritime cities. In Greece, it is particularly apparent after 1204 in the Frankish and Venetian occupied areas. Glazed ceramic plates of various origins, whether local Byzantine or imported from Islamic and, and Christian Mediterranean countries, appeared on the exterior walls of late Byzantine churches, and this practice continued after the Ottoman conquest with Ottoman, local, Italian, and other Western European ceramics until the 19th century. We will focus on a group of 16th and 17th century central uh, ch churches in central Greece and the Peloponnese. 
Ottoman immured vessels from Iznik and possibly from Tatakia are the novel factor, the outcome of the new political reality and change of taste, but they coexist, coexist with Italian Maiolica, which continue to be traded along the, the trade routes. Italian Maiolica are the uh, uh, ceramics, Italian ceramics, uh, tin glazed Italian ceramics. Uh, dating these uh, uh, immured ceramics helps dating the newly built uh, or renovated churches and when possible, unfolds the mechanics of patronage and the status of the donors. Eventually, the study of early churches and their immured vessels will expand our knowledge on the Greek elites of the early Ottoman period of the Tukokratia. Now, this lecture is part of an ongoing research on Greek ceramics in the Greek lands. Uh, my interest was sparkled in relation to the publication of the catalog of Greek pottery at the Benaki Museum, authored by John Carswell and realized now by my colleague Mina Moraitu. The material is exceptional. You will see it as soon, I hope. Uh, so the material is exceptional and was collected by the Benaki family in the early 20th century. It therefore documents the ideological environment and collecting preferences of that age. But what about Sisnik ceramics in the Greek lands during the period of their manufacture from the late 15th, early 16th century to the 17th centuries, when they were not collective items, but products of material culture and of specific, specific luxurious usage? Were they used by Greeks and how? And where? Ceramic ware from Isnik survived in, uh, in Greece, treasured in homes, mainly mansions and captain houses, such as those in Lindos, uh, with their famous plate walls. You can see a reconstruction of such a plate wall uh, in the Museum, in the Museum of Decorative Arts in, in Rhodes. So we have these uh, uh, plates treasured in homes, or we have the Bacini, the architectural decoration, plates embedded on the exterior walls of post-Byzantine churches and monasteries. In the mid-war period, the prolific Greek scholar of Byzantine and post-Byzantine architecture, Anastasios Orlandos, turned them in mute Rhodian or Asia Minor plates, which is the then terminology for Iznik, where Iznik is uh, the uh, Turkish Ottoman name for the Byzantine, for Byzantine Nicaea. More rarely, tiles line the interior of monastic churches, such as the Mount Athos and the, or Mount Athos and the island of Andros. While there is also a group of 17th century plates bearing Greek inscriptions, certifying that Greeks were not only users of ethnic ceramics in that period, but also commissioned them. This form of ceramic art is thus adopted and appropriated into the ecclesiastical and secular environment, serving the purposes of church art and the ecclesiastical authorities of the Ottoman period, as well as the local Christian leaders and notables. In each initial stages, Iznik were is closely associated with court patronage and the Sultan himself, but its later distribution and consumption in the Greek lands and beyond highlight the rise of the new Christian elites and their integration into the administrative mechanism of the empire. In these more or less well-known cases of Iznik ceramics found in Greek lands, we should now add the data from recent archaeological investigation, which have revealed that Iznik ceramics were in circulation from the early 16th century onwards in the Aegean islands and mainland Greece. Although samples from the first half of the century are not many, in most cases, excavators consider them to be products of trade or part of the household goods of Ottoman officials. Before starting with the monuments and their bacini, uh, it is worth looking briefly at the ceramic environment uh, of the early modern period in this part of the Mediterranean and to highlight the special role of pottery as a record of history and material culture. In the medieval Islamic world, in the court of the Abbasids of the 9th century, 
Ceramics were a carrier, a carrier of technological developments, artistic trends, and social status. The Ottomans were the heirs of this tradition, and this is especially evident in the promotion of the ceramic industry by the Sultan, and in the almost monopolistic use of architectural tiles in the interiors of the large Sultanic mosques and the architectural complexes of the 16th century. At the same time, the technology of Ottoman ceramics, stone paste body or frit, which is a, a, a hard, white, uh, glassy uh, uh, body. So, stone paste body, white slip, and uh, transparent glaze, all this gradually transformed the, the pots of everyday use into objects of status on which sophisticated painted decoration could be applied and which could be used at a formal table by courtiers and high ranking officials. At around the same time, the use and scope of ceramics in Renaissance Italy changed when tin glazed by Yorica using techniques imported from the workshop of the, of the Iberian Peninsula and ultimately of medieval Islamic origin. So uh, these pots began to take the place of precious gold and silver vessels, concurrently becoming an economic advantage for those cities or rulers who supported the ceramic industry. In this hierarchy of materials, somewhere between precious metals and polychrome painted ceramics, comes the category of Chinese porcelain, which had a tremendous impact, impact and lasting effect, shaping the technology and the aesthetics of Islamic and European ceramics for many generations. It is telling that after the victories of Selim I, the Sultan Selim I, over the Safavids and the Mamluks, large quantities of Chinese vessels that were held by these rulers came into the possession of the Ottomans. In top Capitolas, where they are exhibited now, they were widely used at the table of the Sultan and his large entourage, while the 17th century they are recorded in lists and of the assets of officials. This brief survey of, uh, ceramic, of the ceramic environment of the time uh, leads us to what will become apparent in the following research. Is this where, in New York or otherwise, and its contemporaneous Italian counterparts share the preferences of consumers in the Greek uh, lands, while Chinese porcelain is rarely encountered, but seems to loom in the background of both. I will start with a small church in Elvia. Uh, uh, which is uh, the Catholic College. It's a small, it's a main church of the monastery, uh, San, San Nicholas in Vathia in Evia. Uh, it is attributed to the mid 16th century by Anastasios Orlandos, uh, whose design you are looking uh, at the screen. Uh, Orlandos underlined the oriental character of the structure and the several Rhodian plates are immured in the walls, and by that he meant that the oriental character was the Ottoman character, and the Rhodian plates were the sneak plates. Uh, the relatively small crossroof church has a, a, a low arched entrance with a limestone door frame, an arched niche, niche above with marble reliefs, reliefs containing uh, uh, Ottoman rosettes and an arch window above with immured sneak plates on either side. All of these being OG arched in the Ottoman manner and surrounded by brick decorated border. The latter also forms a wide rectangular frame around the arch of the entrance, invoking the monumental portals of Islamic public and religious buildings. An idea of these portals you can have by this uh, 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 mosque in Halkis in Evia, the Mirza de Mosque, 15th century mosque. You can see the entrance lined with marble, but uh, the portico that could have given a monumental character uh, to the mosque is now missing. But uh, you can uh, uh, discern here the, the, the arches that uh, um, uh, were part of the, of the, of the, of the portico. These stick plates now are, uh, uh, we said on either side of the window, we can see them. 
there were there were there were five blades initially uh, around the window. Uh, the three of them are now empty. Only the two survive, and they are uh, uh, they have a nice uh, this nice carefully made brick frame around 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 them. Uh, while the other the other three were simply recessed in the wall. One of the blades uh, is decorated with uh, a cypress tree. You can see it there. A cypress tree between two large leaves, so-called sour leaves, that curve like sickles, a motif that appeared in the 1570s. While on the rim, uh, there is a carefully drawn variant of the Chinese breaking wave border, a type of border that we can, we can see on, uh, on uh, Chinese porcelain. Uh, the other plate has a, a, a bouquet of roses and tulips growing from a leafy tuft with a small clasp on the stem. And tiny arabesque designs that tend to continue beyond the, the center. And you can see here the, an example. From 1560 to 1570 onwards, Isnik wears with polychrome naturalistic flowers, including a bright red, became more and more popular and targeted the expanded elite classes of the capital and the provinces. This phenomenon has been led to the increased availability of ceramic ware on the open market as a counterbalance to the prevalence of Chinese porcelain in the court. From the middle of the century onwards, porcelain was increasingly used at the table of the Sultan and his court, and the vessels from this thing became available to a different and wider clientele. However, while the buying public for ceramic vessels was expanding, his nick tile makers forced to work almost exclusively for the larger construction project of the Sultan and his high ranking office officials. They were forced to work. Uh, let's look at the other side of the, of the church. This is the northern side. Uh, and uh, the design of the wall is careful and copies that of the facade, although the, uh, the, we don't have marble uh, uh, reliefs here, but uh, uh, stone reliefs. There is an arch window, and around this arch window, there is a, 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 an sneak plate, an sneak, an sneak dish, and an sneak tie. And there, there, there are two more dishes. Uh, no, uh, one is, uh, is um, there, but the other is empty. Uh, the plate on the top and the, and the tile are uh, framed by brick, border, by brick border. The plate depicts a bouquet of blue tulips and roses. The tile, however, is more interesting. And although one corner has been broken, it is clearly of very good quality. It depicts sun's leaves rosettes, lotus-shaped palmettes, tulips, and plum blossoms in dotted cobalt blue, uh, turquoise, and red. The large sweeping uh, uh, side leaf bear a white tulip, you can see here, on them, a novel decorative device introduced by the chief painter of the Ottoman court, Karam Emik, the Black Emik, which led us to the late 1570s and 1580s. Two sets of tiles include this particular design, uh, one dating to around 1580 from the mosque of Ayyub near the Golden Horn, in the Golden Horn, parts of which are in various museums, including the Benaiki Museum, and you, you see now this panel, and you see the uh, white tulip on, on top of the, of the leaf. And the other set of panel is located in situ in the Ramazan Effendi Mosque in Istanbul, built by Sinan, the architect. In 1585-86, the design of the Ayur Nikolaos tile confidently places us chronologically in the late uh, 1580s. Now, this solitary tile in the exterior decoration of the church appears initially as if it had been used instead of a dish. They did have uh, uh, more plates or more dishes, and they put a tile. I don't think it's, it is, this is the case. Uh, I think that this tile is not devoid of the symbolic meaning usually associated with tile revetments. Indeed, tiles covered larger and larger areas in the interior of sultanic mosques and large complexes were demo uh, and large complexes. Um, 
So they, they covered larger and larger areas in the, in the interiors of Sultanic mosques and had prevailed in the immediately preceding decades in the capital. In these mosques and large complexes were demonstrated the power of the empire and that of the Sultan himself. The ceramic decoration is but one aspect identified with this power, and wherever else it is used, this is reproduced and legitimized. Now there's one more plate uh, in uh, this northern side of the, of the church, uh, which is extremely interesting. It's not a Miznik plate, it's a local production. Uh, it, is, uh, it is of particular interest uh, because it's a little known class of Greek ceramics that in imitation of, of Italian Maiolica have painted decoration in blue and red, orange red on a white slip under a transparent greenish glaze. Authentic Maiolica has a characteristic thin glaze, uh, which at present has not been detected to, in the mainly lead-based glaze. Sample of this ceramic ware, along with killed waste, were found in excavations by the American School of Archaeology in the ancient Agora of Athens, and were attributed to an Athenian workshop in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. They have also been found in excavations in other places in mainland uh, Greece, such as Thebes and Corinth, and also in Crete. The shallow vessel is one of the few surviving intact dishes of the so-called Athenian uh, blue and white, which is better known from surviving jugs. And I'm showing you what, I'm showing you on nice jugs from the Athenian Agora, excavated in the Athenian Agora. Now, the use of Athenian ceramics in Navy, as well as in Thebes, uh, where they have been also found, it's not surprising. They are after all located in the same geographical and cultural environment. This is true for all periods. For instance, we have a mid-Byzantine parallel with the wandering marble, marble craftsmen who were known for their activity in the same area. Later, during the early Ottoman period, which is the period we are uh, uh, investigating, Evia benefited from the artistic flourishing of Thebes with painters from Theban workshops working in its newly built monasteries. The Theban brothers, Frangos and uh, uh, George Condaris, are known for their paintings, not only in the famous monasteries of Meteora and Epirus, but also in the wider area of their birthplace in Thebes and Evia, with the best known example, the monastery of Galataki in 1586, with paintings attributed to the two brothers. The dating now in Agios Nicolaos monasteries was so far based on two types of sources. The Ottoman tax registers of, for the region that were studied by Mahili Kiel, the well-known historian of the Ottoman period, and the founder's inscription. The latter has been published by Orlandos, who read the name Kiel Ioasa, Saed Joasa, towards the end of the partially faced inscription, which is the usual position for the main contributor or patron. Uh, Orlandos identi identified uh, Kiri Joasaf with Patriarch Joasaf II, the Magnificent, uh, from 1555 to 1565. It's the period of the Magnificence in uh, Constantinople. Uh, this dating was thought by Michael Kiel to be corroborated by the Ottoman tax registers for the region, which do not mention the monastery in 1540, but in 1570 and by that indicated that it was built in the intermediate period. Kiel associated the building with the Suleimanic period in central Greece, and even considered that the Church of Agios de Kolos symbolizes par excellence the era of Suleiman, admittedly a period of economic recovery, population growth, and the host of churches and monasteries being built or renovated all over the area. Uh, the church has charged is of a small provision scale and lacks the grandeur associated with the Suleimanic period. Yet there is more. Recent work of a young scholar has attributed the wall paintings to a probable disciple of the Contaris brother before 1608, date read on a wall graffiti. The date 1608 of the graffiti is corroborated by the identification of Kik Yoasaf with a later metropolitan of, the, of, of Halkida from 1593 to 1641. We can assume, therefore, that the monastery was founded or refounded between 1540 to 1570, probably around some early Byzantine church, 
and was thus duly listed as taxed by Ottoman authorities. A scenario supported by local tradition that claims a 15th century founding of the monastery. The new Catholicon we see today was built after the late 1580s, as the ceramics indicate, and before 1608, date of the graffiti on the paintings. Now we will change environment. Oh, this is the caption of the jug. Uh, we will uh, change um, area. We will go to Thessaly. Uh, in the 16th century, Thessaly and especially the monastic community of Meteora and its surrounding area went through a period of great prosperity. Thanks to the various tax exemptions introduced by the Ottoman administration and the ability to act as landowners independently of, of the local authorities, the monasteries had a significant economic and spiritual power to finance uh, the founding, refounding, renovation and painting of their churches. One would expect a series of estate plates to be mounted on the walls of the newly uh, built Ottoman monasteries, Ottoman monasteries, and by that I mean uh, those founded or refounded in the 16th century, such as the monastery of Arlaam in 1541, the new Catholicon of the Great Meteor 1544, 45, or the nearby monastery of Dusiko at Pili near Trikala in 1544. However, in the monastery of Arlaam, there, there are none. In Great Meteoro, they were renewed in the 17th century and we are not considering them today. And in the monastery of Dusiko, where there, were, there were, where there were once a majestic painted monogram of Sultan Suleiman, the, Suleiman I or Selim II at the entrance of the monastery, there are eight immune plates, three of Italian origin and five possibly of local manufacture. Now we can see uh, not, a very, not a very nice picture of, of Dusiko. Dusiko is uh, Avaton. Uh, women cannot go and visit it. It's like, like, the, like Athos. Uh, but here is a design uh, by, uh, so, uh, by, uh, by an architect. And you see the, the, the fortified uh, aspect of the, of the monastery. And uh, uh, maybe you can uh, discern uh, a I'm not sure I can see because there are all these uh, hmm, thumbnails there. Anyway, there is uh, here you can probably you can discern the, the small uh, uh, bacini insert on the on the apes of the other church. And I have also a black and white picture, perhaps it's even better than than the, um, than the colored one. Uh, the plates are renewed on the three-sided apes of the sanctuary, four each on the lateral sides, placed vertically in the recess formed by a blind arch. At the top of each side are the, the two largest plates, two almost identical Maiolicas or thin glazed Italian ceramics. And below each of these are three smaller bowls. Five of them are of the sgraffito type with incised decoration uh, under a light green glaze. One of the bowls on the southeastern side uh, differs and curiously is made of glass. Started with a Maiolica plate on the top. They are uh, immured into a recess specially shaped in size, for size, with the ring protected and with an elaborate brick frame. In terms of ceramics, the Maiolica was Italy's product for excellence and was aimed at a high level buying public. Quite the Fito pop plates whether imported or local, were aimed at, at the mid-level markets. This distinction must have been perfectly clear to those who chose and designed the placement of these ceramics, saving for the Mallorca the highest and most protected position. This type of um, Italian uh, uh, ware is representative of, of production from the workshops of Montelupo in Toscana. The so-called oval and rhombus decoration on the broad rim appeared around 1480 and is formed by continuous blue ovals containing orange rhombuses. I hope you can uh, uh, see it there. In the center of one of the plates, uh, there is a chessboard pattern, a pattern extremely common 
in the first half of the 16th century. You can see two similar plates, one in the Musée de uh, Petit Palais in Paris, uh, and the other in the uh, Ceramics Museum in Montelupo, both dated to the first half of the, of the century. The Dusico plates were undoubtedly bought and immured before 1544, the year of the monastery reconstruction, according to the founding inscription. The Valendrome style lasted until the early 1600s, although by the middle of the century, the design became less meticulous and the use of cobalt blue was reduced because it was expensive. Uh, such a plate uh, with a Valendrome, which is the murder of the Church of Icos Georgios in Therisos in Hania, the new plates of which have been recently published and dated to the last quarter of the 16th century. Montelupo pottery was largely disseminated in the Mediterranean regions and had been found in Spain, in Corsica, in Provence, but also further north in England and the Low Countries, while in Greece it has been found in Crete, Rhodes, and the Peloponnese. So far, Dusico is the only case in inland Greece. The five small uh, bones, uh, the, the green glaze, you can see only the three, uh, are all of similar color, shape, and size, around 12 centimeters. They show markings from tripod stilts and have careful inside decoration with a six pointed sun motif in the center. In the center. Similar ceramics have not been traced elsewhere, as for, for example in the Sgraffito uh, pottery of Pisa, that had a strong commercial circulation uh, inside and outside Italy, including Greece. If we turn to the local ceramic output of Tricala, recent excavations give that some fragments, and you can see these fragments, and kill wasted with incised rosettes under a greenish glaze that reveal a stylistic kinship. The design, however, is rushed and, or, and, uh, and does not compare with the Bacini of Dusico, where the careful decoration is repeated almost identically. The difference in quality may be due to a different workshop, a higher level workshop, perhaps also to the standing of the client who placed the order. And this, in this case, we are in a good ground because we know who the patron of the renovation of Dusico was. He was the most powerful Christian in the province of Thessaly, Neophytos II, abbot of the monastery, metropolitan of Larissa, a relative of Saints, and later a Saint himself. The hypothesis of a local production, however, can only be confirmed by new findings and perhaps by analysis of the, of the material. The real surprise in Dusico is the glass bowl or goblet on the southeastern side of the arch, which is perhaps the sole case of an inured Venetian glass vessel. The bottom of the vessel is broken, uh, as, it is, as, it is, uh, as is the folded rim, but we can assume that it was a small drinking vessel with a wide sloping rim that folded at the edges, made of transparent glass with filigrana straps, where filigrana are the glass canes of twisted white threads. Murano glass makers, Filippo and Bernardo Catani of the Serena family devised the filigrana technique for which they were granted a patent from the Council of Ten in 1527 with a 10 year exclusivity in manufacturing. The inspiration may have come from Hellenistic and Roman mosaic glass. However, Renaissance glass was blown and combined transparent glass with white glass threads in a spiral arrangement called filigrana aretordoli. Recent scholarship has placed the early phase of filigrana glass in the 1530s and 40s, thanks to its depictions in oil paintings of the period, and has identified uh, some museum specimens that were formerly considered later, such as the Goblet of the Victorian Albert Museum, which is now thought to be dated to the 1540s to 1540s. Characteristic of these early uh, items is the combination of transparent glass, stra glass with stripes of white spiral like filigrana, widely spaced, exactly like those of the bowl, goblet of, at the monastery of Dusico, 
which to my knowledge is the only uh, safely dated piece to before 1544, the year of the monastery's reconstruction. The success of the filigrana class was uh, immediate. In 1530, Isabella d'Este, wife of the Marquess of Mantua, visited the Murano workshop where she asked the Serenas to make glasswork for her that resembled that which they had created for Signor Tuco, and Signor Tuco then was Suleiman the Magnificent again. It seems that they had already sent a load of glassware to the Ottoman capital, a load that, a load that could fill a credenza, a, a Renaissance cabinet. This is perhaps the earliest mention of the Ottoman court, court's preferences for Venetian glassware. Better known is the 1569 order for 900 mosque lamps by the Grand Vizier Sokolume Smetta Pasha, uh, which he uh, he ordered them to, to be used for he, in his mosque. And we see one example here, uh, probably coming from this uh, order of Sokulum Metasa. Examples of uh, Venetian filigrana glassware have not, as far as I know, been found in Greek lands. Archaeological and other finds in the Western and Central Balkans reveal relatively rare finds of filigrana in coastal cities such as Zadar, Kotor, or Ragusa, Dubrovnik, as well as inland in Novi, Paz Novi Pazar and Belgrade and in monasteries uh, kept in, the, in their sacristies, such as Vileseva, Tranosa, and Kumaneja. In effect, the filigrana glass objects were exclusive commodities found in the Adriatic ports and the land stations of the routes that led the merchants and goods of the west to the Ottoman capital. What about the the uh, the, the Dusiko? How did they uh, they uh, came to to, to Thessaly? Uh, so the Italian products arrived at Dusiko by a more southern route, presumably via Epirus. The relation of Thessaly and Metera with Epirus go back to the Byzantine period, to the despotate of, of Epirus. But in the 16th century, the roads reopened as part of the Ottoman administration's provision for the communication and movement of goods and people. Dusiko was situated in a critical geographical location on the road that connected Thessaly with Epirus. It is not incidental that the first founder and abbot of the monastery, uncle of Neoptus, who, uh, whose name is, was Vissarion. Uh, so Vissarion was famous for, famous for opening up roads to Ioannina and for constructing bridges that facilitated these mountain roads. And we can, we can see such a bridge uh, built uh, near the monastery and uh, near Pili, the village uh, 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 near the monastery where uh, both Neophytos and uh, Visarion were born. Um, now uh, we move from Thessaly to, the, to Peloponnese. We are changing um, scenery again. Uh, a different uh, area. Uh, uh, Thessaly was. Uh, uh, conquered by the Ottomans in the late uh, 14th century. Uh, in uh, uh, the Peloponnese was in Venetian hands at the very late, as we will see. Uh, so we're looking now at the monastery of Luku in Arcadia near Astor, which is a small town in Kinuria. Uh, so the monastery of Luku was considered by earlier generation of scholars to be Byzantine. Recent archeological study architectural study, excuse me, architectural study indicates that there, were, there was a pre-existing Byzantine church, but, this, uh, but that this was refounded and renovated during the Ottoman period. And specifically the renovation, the renovation can be detected, it can be seen in the dome, the superstructure and the vaulting system. What do we know about the history of the monastery? Uh, we know a few things from a patriarchal sigillion or edit issued by Patriarch Jeremiah III in 1719. According to this edict, in the years of the fall, in the years of the fall of Constantinople, of Constantinople it means, the monastery was, was then in a state of poverty and desolation, and its possessions were being safeguarded in the nearby villages. And the monastery met. When, at some unspecified time, the enemies set on fire the surrounding villages and the monastery's estates, 
possession, a luxurious votive, votive offerings. The reconstruction of the monastery from the ground up was undertaken by pious Christians, a group of 11 furriers who are mentioned by name in the edict, uh, as coming from the neighboring villages of Kinuria, seven Ayanides from the village of Ayos Yanis, and the rest from Ayos Petros, another village, Melivus and Platana. All of them settled in Constantinople, and all these villages are, uh, still exist. The furriers endowed the monastery with land and many votive offerings. They also ensured that the Patriarch Dionysius issued an edict with which the Stavropian status was ratified to the monastery, meaning that the monastery was not under the jurisdiction of the local hierarch, but depended directly on the Patriarch. A well-known historian of the Peloponnese convincingly concluded that this was Dionysius II, uh, who was in office from 1566 to 1555. The information in the edit can be cross-checked by Ottoman tax registers and historical records. The villages were set on fire probably sometime at the end of the 15th century during a difficult and transitional period when Venetian and Ottomans were still fighting over control of the area. The Ottomans prevailed, we know that, but not before the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent when the villages of the region of Kinuria and their neighboring Chakonya were first recorded in the tax registers. It is otherwise believed that the southeastern Peloponnese did not pass to the Ottomans before 1540, when Venetian Nathan and Monenvasia surrendered. The beginnings of the migratory movement to Constantinople of inhabitants from Kinuria and Chakonya and their settlements there should be ascribed to the same period, and the patriarchal edict of Dionysius II in favor of Luku monastery is linked to their actions. It is worth noting that although uh, we usually associate furriers with Castoria and the period around 1660 when Manolakis Castorianos flourished, we also have information about furriers in Constantinople from much earlier. An Ottoman decree from 1560 addressed to the Kadi of Istanbul, the judge of Istanbul, refers to the infidel furriers who were quartered in the inn of Mahmoud Pasha Mihaloglu, a Pasha of Serbo. Byzantine uh, extraction. A, a total of 10 vessels are immured in the church, four on the southern side, two on the eastern, and four on the octagonal dome. One of the immured ceramics is Italian, and five come from Isnik workshops, while the rest, painted in cobalt blue on a white background, Present with difficulties with identification and identification and are very interesting. As we will, we will see below, some ceramics can be dated to the decades of 1560s and 70s and others to 1580 and 90s, which means that the church was completed the earliest in the late 1590s and probably in the 1600s. So we'll start from the, uh, from the Italian plate, a small bowl uh, uh, around the arch window on the, north, on the south side of the, of the church. Uh, around this arch window, there are five uh, bacini. Uh, the smallest one, uh, you see where the smallest one is this small uh, uh, deep bowl, uh, an, an Italian Maiorca with a blue berrettino ground painted with blue dots and, and a large two-colored leaf. leaf. Uh, this type of leaf is found in the drawing, drawings of Cipriano Apicol Passo in his treatise on the potter's art, and was widely seen in both Genoa and the ceramics of Liguria. Oops, you can see the uh, one example, as well as in Venice. From the mid 16th to the early 17th century, similar bowls were made in pa Padua and the Veneto region. We are looking now at, uh, at one of the two sneak dishes uh, on either side of the, uh, uh, immured on either side of the window. Uh, there, are, there are large plates painted with petal shaped panels radiating from a rosette, 
red dots on the narrow flange ring and a double blue concentric rings. The petal shaped panels bear little re resemblance to their Chinese originals, the emphasis being on the intensity of the red relief petals, but enclose a cobalt blue backbone or, and alternated small flowers. It is probably a painted equivalent of a carved Chinese celadon decoration, as seen in other instances of stick vessels. The quality of the glaze on the plates, as seen in other instances, no, the quality of the glaze on the plates and the bright colors are seen even at a distance and can compare to the best production from the stick workshop during the reigns of Sultan Selim II and Murat III, which is the three last decades of the, of the 16th century. The design, the design is not one of his most popular uh, with tulips and naturalistic flowers, but comes from a resurgence of interest in blue and white porcelain. Characteristic of this late blue and white is a departure from the faithful transfer of Chinese models and, and uh, occasionally the addition of bright red. Plate of this type seem to have had a commercial impact because they were also found in the red of a Venetian merchant ship off the coast of Croatia, as well as an excavation of Castel Selino, the Venetian castle in Paleochora near Honia in, in Crete. The last one bears blue and white petal panels radiating from an imitation marble center, a type of decoration normally associated with tiles. There's also one more plate that you can see uh, at the Benaki uh, with uh, 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 double lotus panels. We have lotus panels on the rim and the larger lotus panels in the center. On the eastern side of the church, above the arch, there are two sneak plates with tulips, carnations, roses, iris, and other flowers growing from the leafy tufts. These are variation, variations of the type we already, already have seen, and the type that was wide, widespread from 1570s and the 80s onwards. What stand, stands out, however, for its quality is the plate with a breaking wave border on the foliated rim here, uh, and, then, and the intricate composition in the center that includes broken stems and clasps. So this is a broken stem, and this is a, somewhere there's a clasp. Uh, the plate with the symmetrical bouquet from the other side has red split palmettes and a rim decorated on, uh, with rosettes on a blue background and can be attributed to the 1580s and 90s. There is yet another renewed Isnik ceramics on the southeastern side of the dome. However, this is not a plate but a lid from a deep vessel. Its spherical top is missing. It is characterized by a background of black spirals that originate from the Chinese breaking wave border. This group of ceramics, the spiral patterns and the elongated leaf shaped motifs attributed to a particular workshop in, the, in the, around 1580. We can imagine the type of vessel which this item would have covered as the British Museum and the Sudbeck Canon Museum, you can see the example, have whole example with basin leaves, uh, with basin leaves. Uh, it is of no surprise that a leftover cover was not thrown away but uh, reused. This reuse shows the measure of worth, both symbolic and real, according to these luxurious painted ceramics at that time. Uh, one more example, a plate with uh, this type of, of uh, design. Uh, this plate is in, uh, in the chateau in, in, the, in a castle in France, outside Paris in the Musée de la Renaissance, where uh, many uh, plates coming from Rhodes are uh, uh, exhibited now. But this is a, mat a matter of other, another uh, lecture, I think. Um, and now we'll, we are looking at the three plates, the three bacini, painted in cobalt blue and on white. The particularity of this group of ceramics is that it is related to both porcelain and the zinc ware, as well as imitation of these, but at the same time, specific parallels cannot be traced. The geographical and chronological range on which Chinese porcelain left its mark is wide, from 15th century Vietnam 
and the Safavid Iran of the 16th and 17th centuries to the Ottoman ceramic workshop, workshops of Istik and Kutakia, but also further west from Renaissance Italy to, to the Baroque Netherlands. So what we see here, we see the cavetto of A and B uh, with uh, uh, a style of Chinese uh, motif, a fruit spray, a loquat motif, uh, with a highlighted center of cross lines and dots. Uh, we can see it on, on the cavetto and, uh, and not in the center of B and C. Uh, similar fruit, fruit sprays are found in Ming porcelain from the early 15th century. Uh, and indeed, the porcelain of the late Yuan and early Ming periods had a particular impact on the design of Isnik ceramics. However, the low white motif is extremely rare in Isnik. It is found in, in in quite stylized form in the center of a blue and turquoise a fragment in the Benaki Museum, as well as in the cavetto of a fragmentary plate with the same color palette in the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna. Around in the cavetto, the, the, the local motif is here, and around uh, the cavetto, there are several other uh, Chinese motifs. Another motif, particular motif that adorns, the cafe, that adorns the cafe of A and B is the small circular or octagonal uh, shape with kind of wings that is probably related to a uh, combination of circles and scrolls that can be found in, uh, in 16th century Ming porcelain. Similar tiny uh, motifs are used in isolation in the, on the background of early 16th century blue and white is Nick as on a fragment of this, uh, on a fragment in the Benaki, but are also found in the, in the second half of the century. And we can, uh, we can see uh, two examples. Here is uh, a plate in the Hermitage with uh, small uh, uh, circles and tiny motifs. And uh, uh, this uh, plate in the Sadberg Canum in Istanbul now, uh, which also has the, 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 the strange center, the, the, the affinities with, the, with the, the other plate of Lupu, that one, yes, uh, which has a center with an 11 pointed rosette inscribed in concentric uh, rings. Uh, this is a category of sneak plates with abstract design, reminiscent of kaleidoscope, and that which are normally attributed to the 1570s and 80s. Uh, I cannot conclude on these um, on these um, uh, blue and white pieces, uh, but if we consider the category of, of that, that the category of undocumented ethnic wear seems doubtful, since, since it is the most well known, studied, and wide, widespread type of Islamic pottery, then perhaps we should turn to a production contemporaneous with ethnic, addressed to a variety of clientele but with a wide social and geographical scope, such as the ceramics of Kutahia. Kutahia pottery is associated with tiles and vessels of the 18th century. This is how we know, we know is, uh, uh, the Kutahia uh, uh, vessels. Uh, of course, there are also two famous works, a UN bottle dated 1510 and 1526, respectively, painted in blue and white early is Nick styles, that are, in, that are inscribed in Armenia and considered to be of Kitakia manufacture. However, between the early 16th century and the 18th century, we do not know of any inscribed object associated with Kitakia. Uh, although there are several references, written records, court edicts, and travelers' accounts that document a more uh, or less continuous production. This literary information essentially confirms that ceramic vessels and tiles were produced in Kitahia in the 16th and 17th centuries, but we don't know their particular characteristics in order to identify them and differentiate them from those of the SNIC. We can only hypothesize and suggest that they would have been stylistically related to both the SNIC ware and Chinese porcelain, as are the three blue and white pieces in note in the walls of Luku Monastery. Thank you. So oh, I, I just want to give virtual and, and real applause for that lecture, which not only connects the museum's collections to 
physical monuments in Evia, Thessaly, and Arcadia, but mm. also tells us something about Greece in this period and how Greece participated in global trade, both um, yeah. fabrication of works, but also in receiving works uh, as a sign of status and just um, a kind of interest in a certain aesthetic in this period. I know among our audience, there are specialists in glass. I'm thinking about Anastasius Andonaris, who's with us, um, specialists in Evia, and also people who are from Arcadia and Thessalia who certainly have questions because while well, they've walked around the monasteries you've discussed and looked at the bowls, I think nobody's ever stopped to actually think about what these bowls actually mean or where they're from. And I think it gives us a, an enormous picture of what people were thinking about and what they had access to in this time. 